There we go. If folks can please start taking their seats. Good afternoon. My name is Dave Garcia. I'm a volunteer with the uh, chapter and I'd like to welcome you to our last event of the day before the reception. It'll be a keynote um, address. Um, before we do, a few housekeeping notes. Certainly hope that all of you can join us for the reception. And Connie has assured me that uh, just like last year, it's going to be a wide range of food. Um, be sure to walk through the area where you registered to get your, uh, I think, two free drink tickets. Then after that, um, I think just about any type of cuisine you're going to want, um, you'll find inside. Um, before we get to the keynote, uh, keynote I want to take some time to introduce um, and at least point out one of, one of our platinum sponsors, Centricom. And if you're not familiar with Centricom, um, if you actually if you work with ISSA, you probably are. Centricom has been a sponsor throughout the years. They're headquartered in Finley, primarily known for their managed services, for their data center. Um, they work with other vendors, um, but primarily uh, probably a Juniper and a Palo Alto shop. Been around for years, profitable, growing, very respected. And Kevin Mueller, um, Kevin in the back raising his hand, is the person who can help you. And if you've, if you've been with us through the years, you've probably noticed there's a few extra folks this year. Um, whereas we normally have about 475 people attend, um, very pleased to say that you're hanging out with more than 600 of your closest friends. Um, thanks to Connie and her team, primarily Stacy Camp and Jason Luttrell, uh, things were so well organized, it was marketed so well, that this is actually the first time that we've been in a position due to space limitations at the end of the day to thank four interested sponsors and tell them we're out of room. We're very sorry. You have to keep your money this year. We hope to see you next year. So the net of that, and this is what it means for us throughout the year, year's taken care of. And so if you've been an ISSA member, you typically know what our price points are for our chapter meetings. They're free. We also feed you. Um, we offer hands-on training sessions throughout the year on virtually any topic that uh, someone requests. Hint, hint. Uh, sponsors are welcome to get involved as well. And, um, and we also have some social networking events as well. But, um, but again, um, having done a bit of cat herding, you know, for this organization, to have that out of the way, um, to know that we can once again offer a robust schedule throughout the year, it's a good feeling. So if you haven't had a chance to uh, thank Connie and her team, I certainly encourage you to do so. Um, that being said, it's time to uh, introduce um, our last speaker of the day. Uh, Daryl is a senior consultant with Rapid7. And sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave. So how's everyone doing this afternoon, Stephen? Doing good, doing good. Conference going well, conference going well. Good, good. So my presentation, Ghosts in the Shadows, Identifying Hidden Threats Lurking on Our Networks. And I imagine a number of you are going, what's he going to talk about? Okay. So we're going to get into some things that are a little technical, but I'm not going to get overly technical. My ultimate goal here is to enlighten you, uh, to get you thinking about these ghosts in the shadows and what they are. And we're going to talk about what they are here in a minute. So quickly, just to introduce myself, I'm a senior security consultant for Rapid7. I've been in IT for over 25 years, 14 of those years in security, and I currently do pen testing and consulting work for corporations and government agencies. So interesting with this slide, it's like really hurts the eyes. It's horrible. Uh, but uh, my manager, one of my managers goes, hey, Daryl, you know, usually when you introduce yourself, you ought to, you ought to consider introducing something personal about yourself. So I was sitting there thinking about it, and I really had a hard time telling him that I don't have a personal life. <laughs> you know? I work for you and I break into companies and then teach the companies how to protect themselves. And when I'm at home on my own time, I develop ways to break into companies in my lab at home doing research. So today we're going to share a lot of pieces of those research projects that I've done over the years and how we leverage some of that stuff to compromise corporations with the goal of you learning of this serious risk that exists in your environments and start protecting it. Because the stuff we're going to talk about today, most of the companies I go into are doing nothing about it. And I quickly can gain access, traverse through their network using some of this stuff, and escalate my rights into critical systems. 
So ghosts in the shadows. What is a ghost in the shadows? So what I'm talking about are embedded devices that exist on your business networks. These could be multifunction printers, load balancers, content management systems, application firewalls, IP cameras. The lists go on and on and on. So why are these uh, ghosts in the shadows? Because you just plug them in, turn them on, make them work, and you forget about them. And every one of these devices I've leveraged in some way during assessments to compromise uh, corporate assets. And we're going to get into this. We have, we have videos. We have all kinds of cool stuff. So, so the goal is, is that you really understand the risk. And we got a lot of stories where we get into some detail uh, about how this stuff was actually utilized. So we know what it is. What is it not for this presentation? So in this case, Ghost in the Shadows is not your Windows servers and desktops, your Linux servers and desktops. These systems right now, currently, you should have solid methodologies around securing them properly. Patch management, identity management, anything associated with these systems, antivirus, anti-malware, and a number of solutions. So the reality, those should not be a risk in your environment directly. So moving from there, some things to avoid or some things to think about dealing with embedded devices on your network. Currently, in my opinion, you're fixing all the Windows stuff. You're patching it. You're securing it. You're doing the right things in your Linux environments, hopefully. So anyone not? I didn't think I'd get any hands. I need to check. There's always one smart aleck in the audience, but not tonight. And it turns out, because of that, attackers and hackers are actually starting to pay attention to the embedded devices. I have been looking at them for about three to four years now as part of my job. And like I said, I leverage these systems continually to compromise corporate assets. It's only a matter of time until the bad guys start doing the same thing. And the reality, they have. Good example, community health systems was breached with the Heartbleed uh, attack against a Juniper device, a firewall device. And they were able to pull creds out of the memory of this device, which led to a compromise of their systems, 4.5 million records. And I assure you, you probably don't want to join them, right? Does anyone want to join them? I didn't think so. I expect not. So the goal here today, like I said before, is to kind of educate you, to get you thinking. Obviously, in an hour, I can't give you all the answers. You know, I can't point out all the potential risk, but I can give you some ideas to start thinking so you can go back to your companies, your corporations, your government agencies, wherever you may work, and start brainstorming about how us as an organization can better secure these devices on our network and start paying more attention to these devices on our network. So let's get into introduction to fail. Now, this is the fun part. So I hope you don't mind me moving around. I hate standing on stage too long. I'm only doing this to, uh, so they can keep the camera on me for a minute, and now I'm going to mess them up real bad. So introduction to fail. So what are we talking about? Like I said, we never patch them, right? So how many times do you patch printers on your network? OK, there you go. We don't patch them. We never audit them. How many times do you run any kind of security auditing and testing against these embedded devices on your network? You're paying all kinds of attention to your Windows environments, your Unix environments, but you're not paying any attention to IP cameras that may exist on your network. How about APC UPSs that you use in the data center? Those little boxes, these are all network aware with web interfaces on them. So it's pretty critical. And then last, what was my last one? I can't even see it. Uh, we just deploy and forget. Yeah, that's exactly it. So we deploy these devices on our network and forget about them because they work, right? We only care about them if they don't work. Well, the goal here is to educate you with enough information to start thinking that they won't be an issue and you won't get compromised because of them. Because then you will be aware of them. So will everyone else in the world, when they find out you've compromised and lost 3 million, 4 million records because of some embedded device on your network. So we start off with, uh, Embedded device passwords. 
What's the biggest problem with embedded devices and passwords? Does anyone know the answer to that without looking? You're cheating. I see you all cheating. There you go. Default passwords. So, you know, if you think no one's going to figure out what the default password is your device, then you've obviously never used Google. Okay. <laughs> So when I do an engagement and I find a new device that I've never experienced before, I Google product name, default password. And I'm able to download the manuals, which of course give me the default passwords if they actually exist on the devices. Also, when you do firmware updates on some devices, even if you're really good at, hey, we, we don't deploy devices with default passwords, and then do firmware upgrades of certain devices, it can literally set the password back to default. I know several products that that is the case. So you need to continue monitoring, testing, paying attention to these devices. And the big one uh, is with default passwords that, as an example, let's say, let's say you have a device on your network, and the default password out of the factory happens to be 2222, okay? You're going to say, hey, that's a bad password. I'm going to change it. What I found out historically, you're going to change it to another four-digit PIN number. And it's always going to be higher than 2222. Two, two. So how long do you think it's going to take me to guess 2223 to 9999? I assure you, not long at all. And now I'm into the device. So these are things to think about when you're deploying these devices in your environment. OK, so we get into some stories. I love stories. They're always fun. So how many people have video conferencing systems in your corporations? Now these are like totally cool. I've lost count of the number of times from the internet I've set in on corporate meetings. Okay? Because these devices are deployed, they work, and no one paid attention to the default passwords or the lack of passwords altogether. And, it, and, and you'd amaze the horror in the eyes of the people I'm doing the assessment for when I show them a screen print of a video conference that I set in. Now, I'm nice enough I don't record them, but think of the security impact of that. You're having a corporate conference, and you're discussing acquisitions, divestitures, things that could impact the value of your stock. And now anyone on the internet can set in on that conference. Pretty serious. On a light note, one of the guys I worked with was doing an assessment can't show you my screen, but my camera on my laptop is covered with tape. And I've always done that. He didn't always do that. So he's setting one morning. He gets up at 8 o'clock in the morning. We work out of our homes. He decides he's going to do checking the H323 protocol, which is the protocol used for the video conferencing systems. And boom, he's into the middle of a corporate conference where there's this big beeping noise and everyone in the room turns around and looks at the screen and him sitting there in his pajamas. <laughs> Luckily, he was not in his underwear. Of course, that would have been a better story, but you know how that goes. So the second one I have up there is, say, newborn babies. Well, one of the assessments I was doing was a large hospital chain, okay? And they happened to have a video conferencing set, set up in the, the uh, paternity ward. Uh, and it was also used for people to connect in to see their, their babies from a distant place. Kind of a nice, cool thing. And it was also used for doctor consultation with another hospital. Okay? So I was able to connect into this system. It was a really high quality system with a high quality camera that I could pan around. So I was able to pan this around and zoom in onto several uh, documents laying on tables, which turned out to be HIPAA data. Was able to pull out personal information about the parents, so security numbers, the baby's weight, all this information was stored in this document. The product also had a vulnerability in it. This vulnerability gave me the ability to connect into the operating system and pivot through that machine into the internal network. So not only was I able to steal HIPAA data, I was able to gain access to the internal network through this device because they hadn't been properly patching it. The patch for this had been out for about six months. The interesting thing about this product, when I told the hospital, they go, that's not our product. That's not our equipment. That belongs to the other hospital. It's their problem. How's this their problem? 
I asked. I just broke into your network, stole your HIPAA data that you're responsible for, and gained a foothold in your internal network. So think about that, because we're going to talk about that some more. And this is in reference to subcontract at work, out, outsource type of work, equipment that may exist on your network that doesn't belong to you. Remember, you're still responsible for your network and your security. It's not someone else's fault if you get compromised, even if it is their equipment. So this is my favorite one. I don't know how many people here know me, have been to any presentations. So it's not a lot. So I love this. This is great. So I get a new audience. Printers. I love printers. When I'm done with this section, you're going to be horrified. I promise you. So I've been doing printer research for a number of years. And this is a lot of fun. An example was, uh, and this was probably about two years ago, a mortgage company, simple, small, mom-and-pop mortgage company, had a printer and they exposed it to the internet. Does anyone see anything wrong with that? <laughs> okay, okay. So that, that's leading to fail right off. Well, it turned out they were also using it for faxing all the transaction stuff, so printers and faxing and all this stuff. And it happened to be a, a standard H, HP printer that had PC, uh, PCL printer control language capability. So what I did, I actually connect into it over PCL, gained access to the hard drive on the thing, and captured every fax coming in, containing all the banking information for all of the mortgage transactions that they were doing, because everything was going through that fax machine. So bad. That's definitely a bad. Everyone understand that's a bad. It's going to get worse, I assure you. So uh, I can use printers to gain full domain admin access or full, full access to your, I don't want to say domain admin access, but let's say I can gain access to your Active Directory environment with a valid account in over 50% of the people in here, their companies. I guarantee you that. That's the running averages right now. If I can gain access to any printer on your network, and you've inter integrated that printer into your business environment, that means you know you can go up and you can do faxing and scan the file and scan the email and all these nice cool things which you should be doing. I don't want to scare you away from leveraging these printers correctly. You spend twelve thousand dollars on a printer. You don't want to use it to just print with. That's a waste of resources and money. You want to leverage it into your environment for all the business functions that you could use it for that are good, but you need to secure it. So what we can do is we can pull those authentication and integration creds off these devices. And I will show you a quick little example of this. So everyone see this. This is pretty good. So we have the evil guy. That's me with the skull. So, yeah, I, I carry sunglasses. My, my one VP asked, why do you have sunglasses on your head? That's so I can go into disguise. And no one can pick me out of a crowd. Well, we know that doesn't work with me, so let's move on. So we have, we have a evil guy, we have a printer, and what we have here is your Active Directory environment where you've set up LDAP functionality. What you're going to do is, on the printer, you're going to walk up to the printer, and you're going to go, hey, I need to authenticate myself so I can carry out some type of transaction. So it's going to do an LDAP auth back to the LDAP server, and then that's going to reply with the LDAP reply saying, yeah, he can carry out this transaction. Me, the evil guy, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to log on to the printer, we're going to change the IP address to your LDAP server. Then we're going to go ahead and tell it to do an LDAP lookup, and then it's going to pass me your creds in plain text. And now I can log into your Windows environment and start my evil path to destruction at that point. So about 40 to 50 percent of all the companies I engage, this attack works on most of the printers out there. Okay, pretty straightforward. But remember, the key thing is, is I had to log on. So change the default passwords. We're starting down the right path. You're not 100 percent there. I get a couple quick things I'll point out. But you change that password on that printer from something default or I can't easily guess, and you can render this somewhat incapable. The exceptions to this are if you're running a Rico, I think it was Rico, Rico? Is it Rico? Yeah, Rico printers. Turns out that you can go in there and change the admin password on the Rico printers. I think the normal password is blank, so it's admin blank. You can gain access to it. If you change that password, there's a backdoor account on that machine. It's called supervisor. 
I come in, log in as supervisor on that box, change your admin password back to default, because that's the only thing the supervisor password can do. But you can never see the supervisor account to change the password unless you're logged in as supervisor. Most people don't know that account exists. I've actually was on a message board because uh, I'm a member of a message board for uh, copy technicians. And they come right out and said, hey, here's how you do this, but don't tell any of your customers. What they don't know won't hurt them. Okay? So I've actually used this on an engagement at a company that had hardened everything on their network. I literally had nothing. Three days into this, I think I'd broken into one or two machines and had nothing. So it was like, okay, I really don't like to change passwords on equipment, but hey, I'm tired of having nothing. Okay, so the last day, logged onto his printer, changed the password back to blank, logged on, did this passback attack, is what we call this, and guess what the account was? It was a domain admin account. Game over. It turns out that about 10% of the time, 10 to 15% of the time, when I'm able to compromise a valid account off a printer, it's a domain admin password. The reason why people set these things up for uh, scan to, scan the file system. So you want to scan something, save it on the file system. Oh, it's so hard to get work in using a real account. We'll just give it a domain admin account. And you know what? It'll always work. Okay, so let's move on. Um, videos, I like videos. So I want to show this on a video. I don't want to run out of time here. So let's show a video. Let's see if we can get this going. And this video here is a little more brutal because we're going to show some other attack vectors here. Videos, Aruba, oh, there we go, Ubi, Xerox. Okay. I think I think this is it. Let's make sure. Password extract. Yeah, this is it. So let's go ahead and run this. So this is a Xerox printer. This is kind of cool. Watch this. Watch this. So I'm going to try to log on to the Xerox. The typical default password for a Xerox printer uh, work center is 1111, four ones, okay? So you can see that it fails right here. So it's like, oh, darn, man, I can't get into this printer. Well, this is going to go south really quick here in a second. I actually found a way to actually do firmware injection attacks against all work center printers, where I can get full root level access to these devices. And I can also do things like pull the admin password out of a storage file from the operating system. And I wrote a Metasploit module to do that, so you can all do it now. So we're going to use, uh, it's called uh, Gather Xerox uh, Console, I believe. Man, I must have been typing slow. It's terrible. It's amazing. You think these things go fast until you get them in front of everybody. It's like, come on. Go a little faster. So I ain't talked to these guys down here, so let's do that for a second. So instantly, we, we see the configurates here. And it turns out I actually have a Xerox printer that was sitting in my dining room. Big 300 pound thing. My wife loved it. But uh, it, this one we have J port, which is the printer port, the uh, Jet Direct port is what it is. And mine's set to 9696 to, because I had it on the internet a few times, I was just trying to slow down everyone from hacking me after I told them how to hack me. So. so we set this up, we set up the remote host, which is the printer, we set up the uh, Jet Direct port, and then we go ahead and run this. And what it does is it goes out, does this injection attack into the device, and it'll run some code, and the code will make it go to a file, and it'll parse out the password. It takes, I guess it takes about 45 seconds. That's the timer I set on it. In case you actually have print jobs on the device and it's running a little slow, I need to give it enough time. Because if I run it too fast, it kind of messes up the whole thing. It won't hurt the printer. It's totally harmless. Because I actually stripped all the firmware down. So the only thing it does is it runs the bootstrap program that would do the firmware install. And then I just take that shell script that it runs and I put my own code in there to do what I want it to do. So 45 seconds is like really slow. Let's speed it up. Hit it? Okay, good. Okay, so we can see there we have the password. 
So it's Acme Widget. So now I have the password of the console. And it also saves it off in Metasploit to a, a, a config file. So now we come over here, and now we can log on to the device, give us administrative access to the device. And I'm hoping everyone can see this. I know the lighting's a little messed up in here. but uh, So we come over here to Properties, pretty straightforward. Click on Properties. We come down to LDAP Settings, and we can see there's an LDAP setting in here. And you may see other names on this printer because I bought this printer, so there's some garbage still on the printer name-wise, but it's harmless. This, it was purged of any personal information that belonged to that location, so nothing was compromised with them. I made a point of doing that. So we come over here and we change the IP address. The goal is to change the IP address to point to us. And it's fairly simple. All we have to do is fire up a netcat. Everyone understand what netcat is? It's kind of like a little telnet style program. Uh, and it gives you the ability to move data in and out of uh, a network port. So we set netcat up to listen for incoming connections. So to listen for the incoming, uh, the incoming LDAP connection from the printer, so now we got it configured. We've reconfigured this printer. And Xerox is kind of cool. And a number of printers have this. They have a, a, an actual LDAP functionality in here. So we come over here to the LDAP under uh, mapping. We're able to uh, fire up that. And then we fire up a netcat, like I said. And we set it up to listen on that port that I set it on, 4444. And then we go ahead and... Uh, we should be able to click look up. So now it's just going to do an LDAP lookup. And then we can jump over here to our netcat. And now we have the Windows domain, server, uh, our username, and the actual password for your um, Active Directory. So now we're able to take your printer, log on to Active Directory, and potentially start moving on your network at that point. At a minimum, you know we have access to ever what rights this account had. We also have access to, typically, because no one ever changes it, to everyone. So if you've granted everyone access to it, now we have that. Second, we have access to all of your Active Directory configuration stuff. So I can dump a complete list of every user you have in your environment. I can't get their password, but I can get all your users now. And I can also pull down all the groups they're in and their privilege level. So I can tell every domain name that you have, domain uh, admin account in your system, all with a standard Active Directory account, just like any user can. But now I did it purely with what you had on your printer. Before we go on to the next one. Yes, we have time. Let's see if this is there. Because one of the stories I wanted to talk about, oh, it doesn't want to do it. Come over here. Let's see if we can find this. This is, yeah, I may not have it. We'll just tell the story, because that's really, really good. It's really important. <coughs> Uh, it's actually, uh, so that's, an inter that's a good question. Was the password I got back in clear text or was it hashed? It turns out that all printers that I've ever encountered can be configured for NTLM, can be configured for uh, some kind of hashing, Kerberos, or plain text. So one of the things you do is if the person has set it up to use a encrypted hash communication, you just tell the product to send it to me in plain text. And that's available in every printer also. Because there's a chance that this LDAP may not be a Windows environment. It could be who knows what. It could be some kind of appliance. It could be a Linux environment. So they give you all those options on every printer I've ever encountered. OK. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is a firmware attack. 
So currently I have the ability to get root level access to most Xerox printers, anything below the newest 58, 7800 series that just came out. And I know there's a way of doing it on those, I just haven't developed it yet. Uh, so one of the guys was on an engagement the other day. Like I said, I can get root level access to this. So I can get a command line bash shell on a printer remotely. He actually broke in through the internet through password guessing attacks and gained foothold into a Citrix box. This company turned out to have really good antivirus, anti-malware solutions and a lot of restrictions in their Xerox environment. So we were never able to get code on there to launch further attacks on the internal network. So I talked him into, hey, look at the printers on the network, which is what he did. And he found a Xerox that was vulnerable to our attack. And I developed a package for him, and he used standard LPR command, line printer command, in the Windows environment to dump this package, because this is just a print job. This attack's purely a print job. The print job hit the printer. The printer called out over the internet and gave us a bash shell with root privileges onto his printer. The printer also had SSH running. So we set up an SSH reverse tunnel. We were able to tunnel in through their printer which connected out to us on the internet, giving us access on the network, basically undetectable. And unless you're doing some kind of anomaly, uh, anomaly checking of your devices, do you, would you notice if your Xerox printer called out over the internet? Maybe not. Maybe you would. Uh, if you have a way of doing that, I would consider taking all devices that you know shouldn't be going out to the internet and monitoring them if possible. And all this code's available in Metasploit stuff. And the patches for the Xerox, I want to give you the patch for it. We know what the, the RICO is to change the password, okay, for supervisors, so you can't be backdoor. On the Xerox printers, go in, there's a setting in there for remote firmware upgrades, turn it off. And then set the password to something complex and not some number between 1112 and 9999. <laughs> Set it to something complex. At that point, if you need to do a firmware upgrade on it, you can easily log on, turn it on, do the firmware upgrade, and turn it back off again. That will prevent the printer from being attacked, period. I would love once, one engagement I did to actually find somebody who's done that. Uh, and I've been, this is something that's been out there for close to three years now. And I lost count of the number of times I've preached about this. So I'm hoping everyone will go back from here, get something from this, and kind of start reining in these embedded devices so you understand what the risks are to them. Okay, moving from there, we have simple network management protocol. Do we have anyone here that runs their entire network and manages it with SNMP, simple network management protocol? Okay, prob probably not, probably not. Um, the interesting thing with this... Um, is that, oh, the best way to do is just show it to you. Here we go. This happens to be a brocade load balancer. This was an assessment I did. This is not a screenshot from an assessment I did. This was one I did further on later when we were doing some testing. But simple network management protocol, a number of devices will commonly enable it with a community strings of public and private. So you guys do not use SNMP in your environment. I assure you I can go into your environment and probably find dozens, if not hundreds, of devices that have SNMP enabled by default with public and private community strings. Public gives me the ability to read data off these devices, or at least the SNMP data. Private would give me the ability to alter those devices, which is a bad thing. Okay. In this case here, the brocade load balancer I found on the internet during an assessment, and I dumped the SNMP. OIDs off the box. I walked the entire thing. And during analysis, I found a string entry that started off with $1. To me, that is a typical Linux shadow file des encryption. So I said, hey, I wonder if it is. <laughs> I fed it into a password cracker. I cracked the password in 24 hours. I logged into their load balancer from the internet and gained access, full admin access to the device. And this happens to be a module that's been written for doing that. Now, this has been patched. It was patched about uh, a year ago. 
I think. But as you can see, we were able to dump all these hashes. The bad thing about this, I mean, I mean, these hashes that you see here are probably going to be the same passwords that are used on all of your infrastructure devices in your organization, most likely, which is seriously bad. Uh, when I did this, uh, how many people have heard of Shodan? Okay, so we have a few more numbers to Shodan. Shodan happens to be like a, for no better words, it's kind of like a Google type device where you can request information on devices based on ports and services that are run. So the internet's like being scanned constantly and this data is being gathered. So I can go to Shodan and I can go give me the SNMP, all SNMP devices out there port 161. And there's like, I don't know, I think it's like 60 million around the world exposed to the internet. In this case here, there was about 1,000 to 2,000 of these devices on the internet with this problem. Okay, the vendor patched this quickly, which is great, that's what we expect. And then it was a number of months later after they patched it before we actually made any of this stuff available. So it's for everyone's protection. So if you happen to have brocade load balancers on the internet and you've never managed to patch them, I'd seriously consider doing that. <laughs> that would be a bad thing. Okay, so come back here. And SNMP strings is kind of interesting. So when I'm dealing with an organization that actually uses SNMP strings, they set public and private to something else, okay? And because one is only read and the other one's read and write, which is a, a lot more worse. With a read and write community string in a company that actually leverages SNMP, I can pull the running configs off all your Cisco routers with a read string. Okay? So it becomes a real issue if you deployed it in your entire environment, but you've never properly secured the environment. An example, best one I can use, is an IP camera. On an engagement, they had implemented SNMP across the, the gambit of devices, but they didn't bother to secure the devices properly. So logging in through an IP camera, I was only able to get like the public string because it didn't have a private string, but it gave me public. So then I could take that custom public string, play it against other devices, and then search the public output data for a private because public was also contained in private. Now I had the private, I can go and pull the running configs off all the Xerox, or uh, I'm sorry, running configs off all of the Cisco devices remotely. And then I can go through there and find passwords. And if you're using password 7, it's easily decrypted. If you're using the more complex ones, I have to feed it into a cracker. But as you can see how, and this, and I hope you've noticed in a number of these presentations, a number of things I'm talking. This is the methodology that's used by most breaches. We gain a foothold in an organization. We move lateral and we escalate our rights. Every breach takes that model. So if you've noticed every story I've given you, we've used the same model. I gain access to one device because of a weak password. I pull the SNMP data for public. I use public, moving lateral until I find a stored private. Now with private, I escalate my rights and then I continue moving until I get to where I want to be and take over what I want to take over. The same method most breaches follow if you read up on what took place in most of these breaches. Uh, you may get some write-ups that say it was advanced. These people were compromised through an advanced attack. I assure you, in most cases, they are not advanced attacks. They are trivial attacks. The last one I want to mention here is dealing with cable modems. So uh, this one's kind of it's kind of interesting. Um, so I did a research project last year dealing with simple network management protocol, looking for devices that leak critical information. And it turned out that we found a number of cable modems, so cable modems and DSL modems. Now these are cable modems and DSL modems that may exist in your homes. These are DSL cable modems that may exist in your satellite offices. We found out that over the internet that we're able to actually enumerate these devices when they're uh, dual devices that also do Wi-Fi and pull the WPA pre-shared keys in plain text off the device remotely over the internet. Uh, once we figured out this was a reality, 
we went out and purchased about 10, 15 different devices and went through to see how many we can find and then compared the ones that we found this problem to data off Shodan and we found out that we could compromise using this methodology over 500,000 devices on the internet. About, uh, about 150,000 of those were in the U.S., about another 150,000 in South America, and, and then the country of Turkey had like 275,000, and then we gave up and quit looking. Uh, but I assure you there's probably a lot more out there. So that makes me think about, you know, satellite offices, because I've actually found these same devices during assessments sitting at satellite offices. These are those small offices where you have two or three sales guys or just two or three people that do work. You don't want to put up a big expensive connection, so what do you go out? You go out and buy a cable modem, uh, a DSL modem, and you set up some simple VPN connectivity for them. <coughs> Pretty straightforward. But it's a potential entry point for exploitation because if someone decides they're going to do this research and it's not me, <laughs> and they find this data, they could easily go, hey, here's company ABC. Let's go ahead and do some search on the internet. We find all the IP addresses that belong to ABC. We go ahead and scan those. We happen to find some cable modem. We enumerate SNMP. Now we got Wi-Fi. We figure out where that satellite location is. We drive out to their parking lot. We log onto their network. And now we're in their internal network. So this is getting interesting. I'm getting this horrid stare at me. So you guys finding this valid information, usable information? I'm hoping you are, because I really want to get everyone thinking about these devices on your network, because they're critical. Let's get to this point before they get to this point, because I don't want to see anyone compromise. I'm here for security, not insecurity. Yes, sir? Um, that varies. I'm going to remember, I only looked at a small handset. A number of the ones I've seen in the U.S. that were most easily compromised were ones that are being phased out, okay, which is good. So we're dealing with, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, the old Natopia devices uh, were really bad, uh, Ubi devices, but most of the Ubis are not being used on the Internet inappropriately. They're vulnerable but the providers are using them appropriately, which is a good thing. Uh, if you search my name in SSID in Rapid7, you'll find all the advisories and actually get a list of all the actual modems that we did actually test. And I'll give you, it has all the OIDs that you can actually query for the data too and how we did it. Was there another question down here? Okay, excellent, excellent. So moving from there, so wireless. Now this was this was probably one of the most fun research projects I did. So so my job as a uh, consultant pen tester is to think outside the box. So let me propose this to you. So everyone, I hope everyone knows what an SSID is. You know, if you have wireless and you want to connect to wireless and you, you look on your device and it gives you a name and, and that name of the device you want to connect to, that's the SSID. That name is the SSID. That name can only be 32 bytes long. So one day I was sitting there and going, hey, you know, I have these thoughts once in a while. It's like, hey, I wonder if I could use an SSID to launch a tax against somebody. It's only 32 bytes long. What could I do with SSIDs? So I started testing a few devices and found a number of vulnerabilities where I was actually able to fire up an access point with an SSID and carry out attacks against corporate enterprise level equipment. Because I was a rogue access point and you're monitoring for rogue access points. And you go, look, a rogue access point. I got a video for this one. Okay, so real quick on this thing here, so you see this. This happens to be an Aruba console for a wireless LAN controller. 
This up here happens to be the rogue access point I'm going to fire up. It's a soft AP, so I can control the SSID more readily. This happens to be a third-party FTP server located on another system. So uh, the whole idea is here is to carry out a cross-site scripting attack to inject Java code into a system's console where you may see this system actually logged in, see this system in a data center where they're monitoring on a warboard. Hey, we're monitoring for rogue access points 24-7. So I'm going to give them a rogue access point to monitor. And we get to see what happens here. So I'm kind of walking through here showing some different things. I think I'm showing the configurations. And currently there's, uh, there's an admin account. And there's the rogue access point. Let me get that off there. It's blocking it. Ah, that's not good. There we go. Okay, so we can see all the rogue access points on here as they're showing up down here at the bottom in the different numbers. And this is our, uh, this happens to be, uh, it has to fit in 32 bytes. That was my challenge. I had to fit the entire attack vector into 32 bytes. So we see all that, and then we come over here. I'm going to actually show that there's no files sitting there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come up here and we're going to go fire up this access point or this rogue access point. And I set it up to uh, be obvious. I get easily hidden the attack, but we're going to be obvious here. So when we kick this thing off, so access point fires up. This device they're monitoring in the data center goes blank. Now I could have hidden all that. So what actually happened? It's kind of cool what happened. That Java code just hit that box. Two things just took place. I actually dumped the running config of the device off to a third-party FTP server remotely. I think I play around with that just for a second. Let's move on. And if we look right here, as soon as I come over here, you'll see it uh, show up under, I don't think that's it. Come on over here. Wrong window. Come over here to administration. We just created an ID called evil hacker with root level privileges on that device. So fire up an SSID within close proximity of a company. Wait for... I don't know, half an hour a day if we know they're monitoring this. And instantly I've created these kind of creds. Uh, I could have done anything to this particular device. I could have actually reconfigured it, had it fire up other access point functionality for me where I can get in remote access. But this is purely a proof of concept that I did um, to get people aware of, of this as a potential attack vector. Now the big thing here is this is all about patch management. Uh, so you want to patch your devices. <laughs> so if you happen to have a Ruba <laughs> and you haven't patched it in two years, I would advise you do so. So everyone understand what took place there. I just want to make sure everyone understood that. Okay, so everyone, everyone did understand that. I'm going to make sure I don't take this too far off. Okay, we're running out of time. Uh, the last story, this was kind of quick. I cannot leave out of it physical security. Physical security is cool. This was not mine. This was a friend of mine. So he wants to go, go into a company and break into a company through physical security. Turns out this company had a bio reader for entry into the company. So he marches up to the bio reader, opens it up, finds an RJ45 jack, Attacks is a wireless access point. He does this right in the middle of the day, just wearing some worker's uniform while everyone's coming on, scanning their thumbs on this thing to get in the building. And uh, he says his worst part is, is the access point he had was too big to get back inside the thing. So he left it hanging out of it and just walked out and sat down in the parking lot to see if anyone would notice. Uh, and no, they did not. <laughs> Logged into the company, sat there for a while, and then basically uh, went up there and disconnected his hardware, shut it up, and left. So if you have this type of connectivity, devices, or anything that takes your network outside the perimeter of your building in any way, shape, or form, think about that stuff sitting out there. This is a hardware. This is an embedded device from my perspective. It is a risk to your organization.
So does anyone have one of these devices? <laughs> I, would, I expect you wouldn't admit to it. Uh, if you do, just make sure it's secured properly. Apparently this did not have the proper security on it, and somehow he was able to easily pop the case open without damaging it. It was probably like a clip or a screw or something, and he opened it up and it just opened up. Okay, so now, now we've talked about the worst. We've talked about breaking stuff. Talked about stealing stuff. Showed you a bunch of horrible videos. Showed you your printers are your, you're going to be your death. Well, hopefully not. So let's get on the protecting your environment, because this is kind of cool. I, I love the protection part. So asset management, patch management, threat and vulnerability management. Those are the areas we're going to kind of talk about real quick. So what are you doing for asset management? Do you know the embedded devices you have on your network? How many here know all the embedded devices on our network? Please, somebody raise your hand. Okay. Okay, that's not bad. 95% is good. 95%. But that's, that's kind of interesting. It brings up a story. I worked at a very large Fortune 500 company and had a very bad argument with the CTO. And that was after a critical meeting with management where he basically said, there's no way for us to know in a company this large what we have on our network, so we're not even going to try. We had some words. He threw me out of his office, and I continued harassing forever about it. I liked the guy. He was a good guy, but I disagreed with him. So you want a comprehensive method for identifying your assets. I don't know what that is. I mean, you're going to have to make that decision for yourself from a business perspective. How are you managing your current Windows Linux assets? How can you figure out how to manage those assets? These are things I want you to think about when you get back to your company. I mean, it may be as simple as what I mentioned before, SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. There's a lot of products out there that you can do global management and they'll automatically scan your network and identify new devices and new IPs and inquiry for SNMP and identify what the product is. There's a lot of good products out there. I'm actually testing some right now. So if you buy them, <laughs> make sure you keep them patched. Um, so don't forget, if it's on your network or touches your network, it is a risk to you. Just like I'd mentioned earlier. You want to pay attention to those things. It's not someone else's product. If it's on your network or can be used to gain access to your network, it's your problem, not someone else's problem. That doesn't mean you can't handle some of the stuff from a contractual standpoint, but that contractual standpoint would be you defining to them how that device is going to be configured on your network, not them telling you how it's going to be configured. Most companies I've dealt with, the printer, they, you, know, you guys go out and you, you uh, contract printers. Printers are expensive. It's easier to lease them. It's, more, it's less complex. But remember, those printers are a risk to you. So from a contractual standpoint, you need to define some of those settings. Passwords will be changed. They'll be complex. If you want them changed regularly, it's your network. If they want your business, they'll meet those requirements. So I recommend considering those type of things. Uh, outsource, outsource systems and uh, obviously anything managed outside the network. If it's on your network, it's your responsibility. So patch management, and this is a hard one. You know, I, I can't even imagine what it's going to take to rein this in. And it's going to be something you're going to have to decide on how you're going to do that. How do you identify, well, once you've identified all the embedded devices on your network, how do you go about identifying needed patches? And how do you regularly check those? You're going to have to build a process around that. And I don't know if there's any perfect one out there. There may be some third-party products out there that make this easier to do. I have not encountered any of them because I haven't encountered anyone actually doing it right. If I had encountered somebody doing this right, I'd share that information with you. But it's all about managing those devices, those IP cameras. Uh, and you think, well, how's an IP camera going to be an issue? I just spent the weekend with some friends down in Raleigh, North Carolina, and it locked in a locked in a hotel room at a hacker conference where we had labbed up IP cameras and were actually carrying out attack tests against them. Did we find anything critical? No, not at this point. 
other than one of the high-end cameras we were looking at, we found out that we can enable SSH and possibly use it as a pivot point on the network, which is critical. And if you're monitoring these things and managing these things, the attack vectors that we may think up or research, we're going to eventually share with somebody, you know, in an ethical manner. But there may be people out there that aren't ethical like us, coming up with ideas to attack you. So it's important to be able to come up with solutions to manage these devices and patch management. Does anyone in here have a patch management solution that goes beyond uh, the Windows desktop client environment? Okay. That's good. Threat and vulnerability management. This is a big one for me. This is something I did when I was at a large Fortune 500 company. It's something I took a lot of pride in doing. Start with, do you have a security team? I assume most of the people here have some security team, even if it's one person. Yeah, okay. So if it's a one-person security team, you know, what can you do? In those cases there, I would recommend actually looking at outsourcing solutions. They're, they're valid solutions, and I think they're, they're a good thing, because obviously you need to secure your environment if you can't get the resources or the full-time FTEs to be able to do that. Outsourcing is a valid solution for being able to get third parties to be able to handle some of that security stuff for you. <clears throat> do you conduct any proactive security monitoring? So what I'm trying to say here is, does anyone in your organization log on to Google <laughs> and look to see what's going on out there from an attack vector. Does anyone look at the latest, greatest malware that may be coming out? So we got a hand back here, we got one. This is cool stuff, because this is where it all works. This was something I did for a Fortune 500 company. Now obviously not everyone can afford a Daryl to sit in there and have a lab to do this stuff, but I was in a Fortune 500 company in the mid 2000s, the 2003-2006 time frame. I actually called to within three to four days every worm that hit the street. The first one was Blaster. When I told my company, I actually demoed the exploit to them before the worm ever hit. Because I lived in that realm. I had my ear to the railroad techs. I did that security intelligence work for the company, I played with the devil and was able to get code like that off various Chinese hacker groups. Lab them up, test them, see if they were really possible to carry out attacks with. Now obviously that whole realm has changed. It's a different world now. That method wouldn't work. But security intelligence is still a valid uh, part of your organization. If you know what's going to happen, you know what people are doing, you know what the attack vectors are. You have a better chance to protect it. And that's what we did back then. The first one, I had a meeting with like 40 people. And these were all managers. We had an IT department over 700. We had like 40 managers that ran these seven, 700 people. And I demoed this attack vector and told them it was 100% perfect. It would not fail. And when it got turned into a worm, it was going to get bad. They laughed at me told me I was, called me Chicken Little, the sky's falling, this ain't ever going to happen. I got pissed at him, walked out of the room, told him they were going to get hit with a worm within seven days. Five days later, they got hit with a worm. The only thing that saved them was the one manager that was like making fun of me actually went out and started patching his systems and, and it tooled up his group to roll out patches rapidly. If he hadn't done that, it would have been really bad. So after that, it was kind of interesting. Every time something hit the news, I had 40 managers standing at my desk going, what do we do, Daryl? What's going to happen? Is it going to happen? Is it going to be a worm? Uh, so I got credibility real quick. Of course, they were. He, he, he had actually proposed that if we didn't get hit with a worm within seven days that I should be fired. Luckily, we... And of course, then there was the stories of Daryl wrote the worm, <laughs> which I did not, but uh, you know how that goes. So, so from a security intelligence standpoint, really consider this. 
really think about security intelligence. And there's services out there that can provide this stuff for you. Because if you know what's going on out there in your real world, in your environment, you have a better chance to actually mitigate those risks before the damage is done. And be able to define real risk for your organization if you understand what's going on. So in, in conclusion, I'm, I'm hoping you got something out of this. Uh, and it was enlightening. Uh, those are my contact. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Because uh, I love this. I love security. I live, eat, and breathe this stuff. And my goal is to help everyone be secure as possible. And I've been living in the embedded device world pretty heavily for five or six years in the goal to understand this risk and hopefully head it off before it becomes a, a big issue for you. Now, I know a lot of people don't may not like the research I do and the fact that I publish this information. But remember, when this information is published, the vendor's there, the fixes are there, the workarounds are there. This isn't blindsiding nobody. But if you don't pay attention to what's going out there, you're not paying attention to none of the devices you have on your network, you don't know what you have on your network, the work I do is wasted. Because now, only the bad guys have access to it, or the consultants, assessment engineers. Not you. And the truth is, you need to have that information. And that's why I'm here. And I'm hopefully I gave it to you, you enjoyed it, and uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? So I forgot about questions. Someone have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, we have we have a guy at Rapid Seven that's actually doing uh, embedded device research. Uh, so feel free if you have any questions to contact Rapid Seven. Contact me, and I can get you his information. Anyone else? Well, I'm going to be around most of the evening. Right now, I got to go do some quick work, but I'll be at the event tonight until eight, nine, ten o'clock. So feel free to uh, engage me. Thank you.